In this video, we're going to see how to integrate Timeleaf and Bootstrap's list group and list group item components. In a previous series of videos, we saw that we could wire up a search term to a controller in Spring Boot. That controller calls down to a service layer. The service layer calls down to a DAO. The DAO reaches out to a JSON stream that has a parameter, a search parameter. We put in that search parameter that we got from the user in the HTML form, and then we return a list of matching plants. That's where we're starting in this video, because we have the list of matching plants, but we don't yet have an HTML page that can show those plants. So in this video, we're going to show those plants with Bootstrap and with Timeleaf's TH each component. Let's jump right in. So first of all, it's probably easiest to start with the page that I already have. So I'm going to start with this start.html page, and I'm simply going to choose copy, and then go back up to templates, right click and choose paste. And then we'll rename this to, well, let's take a look. What are we returning? It looks like we're returning plant results as our view name. So let's make this one plant results.html. Let's make the case the same. So plant results.html, and then choose OK. Now we want to maintain the structure of this page. In other words, we want to maintain things like the time leaf imports and also the CDN for Bootstrap that you see here on line six and seven. Uh, it, we also definitely want to maintain this top navbar include. We put that together in a prior video, but that keeps a consistent navbar look and feel throughout our entire application. After that, we can start gutting some of this because what we see which follows our navbar are some things that are specific to our very first home screen. So let's go ahead and take it down to just some basic HTML. Now we save, and next thing we're going to do is take a look at what we're returning from our controller. And we're returning this collection of plants, and uh, we are saving it basically as this name plants. Okay, so back to our page. Uh, what we're going to do now is say div class equals and we'll say list group. So list group is a class that's given to us by Bootstrap. And then we'll simply close that div. Now, what makes this interesting is that we can combine the class list group, which is, as I said, with Bootstrap, we can combine that with a special tag that is part of Timeleaf, and that is th each. The th each tag allows us to iterate over a collection. So we're going to say th each equals, and then we'll do a double quote. And of course, that will give us a closed double quote as well. So inside of this open and closed double quote, I'm going to say plant and then colon. Whoop, spell it right just one moment. Plant colon. And then we'll say dollar sign curly plants close curly close double quote. So what we're doing here in the language of time leaf is we're saying iterate over this collection of plants. And that collection of plants is the same thing you see right here, the results of our JSON query. And every time we iterate, or in other words, every time we're loop, we loop, we're going to shake hands with another plant object. The plant object we're shaking hands with is going to be stored in this variable here called plant. We can reference that plant object inside of our loop. Now, if you're a traditional programmer, you might say, well, I don't see the loop. What's the boundary of the loop? Well, essentially, this div tag is like an open, close, curly for a loop. So whatever we put inside of this div is what's going to print out onto our HTML page every time we shake hands with a plant. So inside of this, let's tab, and we'll start with a fairly simple example. We're going to make this a group that can link. So I'm going to say a href equals, and for the moment, we'll just put in a pound symbol, just kind of uh, keep us where we are. So a href equals, and then we're going to say uh, class equals, and we'll say list, whoops, group item space list group item uh, action space. And by the way, that's dashes between each of those words and then active. And then we'll terminate our A. Now, within this, we're going to say, we're going to do one more thing, and that is we're going to print out the look and feel for the plant, something that identifies the plant. So within this A tag, I'm going to say P, and then TH colon text equals double quote, dollar sign, open curly, plant, close curly, 
and then we'll simply terminate the p tag. So what, what's happening here is we're taking this p tag and we're replacing it with whatever text is represented by this plant object. And what do I mean text that's represented by this plant object? Well, in Java, we can get a textual representation of an object by invoking a method called toString. We'll see more on that in a little bit because, frankly, the default implementation of toString leaves a little bit to be desired. It's not really human readable. We're going to need to take care of that. That's one thing that we want to consider. Another thing that we want to consider is that if we look at line 15 through 19, we remember that we have two things going on here. The classes that you see, list group, list group item, list group item action, and you know what, I'm going to take off active for just a moment. But these classes that we see come to us from Bootstrap. And on the other hand, the th tags come to us from Timeleaf. So we have a little bit of mixing together, but it's nice that the way that they do it is they use attributes of these HTML tags. And we can use attributes from both Bootstrap and Timeleaf simultaneously. One more thing that I want to do, I want to be very clear on this iteration variable plants here. You see that's a plural plants. So what I'm going to do is back in the controller, well, let's look at line 113. On line 113, we're putting an object into our model and view, which makes it available for rendering on the HTML page. But let's be a little bit more explicit here. Let's go ahead and say, let's give this associated with a name called plants. So we'll give it a little name association there. And now it's very clear that this plants object that we're adding is essentially what we're getting on line 106, which is an object representation of the JSON stream that we're parsing. And we're parsing that JSON stream based on the user's search term. So nonetheless, I just want to connect some dots here and show that this collection plants is associated with the name plants. The name plants is what we're iterating over on line 15. Each time we shake hands with one of those plants, we put it in the variable called plants. So with that, let's go ahead and restart in the debugger and let's take a look at how it looks once it runs. So I right click on plant places application and simply choose debug as and then we'll say Java application. Give it a moment here to cycle. Fortunately, it doesn't take too long with Spring Boot. And uh, now I'm going to go back and let's take a look at our look and feel. So we'll just, just one moment here. Change this. We'll start back at our start page. And familiar start page. Now I'm going to search on Redbud. And we'll choose search. And probably going to hit a breakpoint here. Sure enough, it hits a breakpoint. Uh, not too concerned about this breakpoint because we went through it in a previous video. So I'll go ahead and just choose resume and let it keep running. Now let's go back and take a look at our look and feel. Well, now I searched on Redbud, and if you remember from a previous video, there are about 18 Redbuds. Now you see that we have 18 Redbuds, roughly, or 18 plants that we're showing in a list now. Now we didn't see this before, but this is essentially the result of our query. The only thing is it gives us a really funny look and feel here because it's com.plantplaces.dto, which is the package where our DTOs live, and then the plant DTO class, and then an at symbol, and then some hash code that was generated to uniquely represent this object. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense to an end user. And the reason is what it's doing is it's calling the toString method that we get in java.lang.object. So we'll take a quick peek at the documentation here. We'll go straight to the source. And the default implementation of this toString method returns a string representation of the object. The default implementation, get class, get name, at symbol, and integer dot two hex string hash code. That's what we're looking at, but we know it's not very user friendly. So question then. If we want to make something that's a more user-friendly representation, string representation of this object, what do we do? Well, this toString method is declared all the way up on the Adam and Eve class called java.lang.object. And if we take a look at the toString method, we'll notice that it is um, essentially friendly scope or package protected. There are several different, oh, actually, I'm sorry, it's public, isn't it? So it's a public scoped method. That means we can overwrite it. Now, where do we want to overwrite it? Well, we want to overwrite it in the class that's being represented here on this page, which as you see is plant DTO. So let's run into our application and let's take a look at our plant DTO. A very typical uh, DTO that we'll see, uh, essentially a plain old Java object. We have a GUID, a genus, species, cultivar, and common. 
So let's go down and let's override the toString method. I'll go towards the bottom, which is typically where we put the toString method. It doesn't have to, have to be there, but that's a good place. So toString and control space, and you see method step, or actually I like the one down below a little bit, bit better. You see override a method in object and enter. And you see this gives us the whole signature that we need to override the toString method from drop a line object. Now we just have to decide what to return. So this will be fairly straightforward. We can return essentially the GUID, genus, species, cultivar, and common name. So let's say GUID, return GUID, plus space, plus uh, genus, plus space, plus species, plus space, plus cultivar, plus space, plus common and terminate with a semicolon. Uh, you might look at this and say, why aren't you using a string builder or a string buffer? And you'd have a good point. I could use that. Uh, several other things that we could think about for this, uh, like, uh, you know, we have a lot of pluses here, a lot of things going on. So let's go ahead and restart one more time, and let's see if we get a little better look and feel. So debug as and Java application, and we'll give it just a few moments. I love how quickly this starts up for us. Back to our browser, and we can go ahead and just search directly from this screen. So one more time, let's say Redbud, and then let's hit search. We know it's going to more than likely hit a breakpoint, which sure enough it does. Again, we've already walked through this part, so we can play through the breakpoint, and then we can come back to our page and take a look. This is a little more user-friendly. I'm tempted to pull out that uh, unique identifier that GUID right there, but you see Circus Canadensis Eastern Redbud, Forest Pansy, Hearts of Gold, Ruby Falls, each one of these is a red bud. As a matter of fact, let's go ahead and try one more step. I'm going to remove our breakpoint so we can do this a little bit faster. So remove the breakpoint and back up. And what happens if I just go up here and type oak and search? And you see we get a bunch of oaks and it's actually pretty snappy. If I choose maple and search, and we get a bunch of maples. So you see that sure enough at this point we're able to take data from the user in an HTML form, pass it to the controller, controller to service, service to DAO, and then get back results and show them in a nice look and feel. Now one other thing we might want to consider is what do we want to do when we click on these items? Well these are coming from the Plant Places website and the number that you see here, let's pick one of these. Let's pick uh, Acer Capolippi's Snake Bark Maple, which is 1721. If I go to Plant Places, and I will search on, let's say, Redbud, and search, you notice a very similar look and feel with the search bar up at the top. I choose Eastern Redbud. Take a look at the top here, and you see there's a plant ID that is 83. I'm going to truncate everything that follows that, and I'm going to paste in 1721, which should be the Acer Capolippis. And we take a look, and sure enough, Acer Capolippis, as we thought, and we have some pictures here. So what we could do if we wanted to make a better use of that global unique identifier is we can make our table hyperlink to this external website. It's going to require a little bit of tricky syntax. So let's start just by copying this URL. And essentially what we're going to do is take that global unique identifier and plug it in as a variable to this URL. So let's go back to our plant results page. Okay, number one, instead of using just the normal href attribute, let's use the th href attribute so it knows that this needs to be time leaf parsed. The bootstrap classes that follow, no problem. We can leave those as they are. It's the href value that gets a little bit tricky. In the land of timeleaf, what we need to do if we're inserting a value into an href is start with an at symbol, then an open close curly. And this is the syntax that just says, hey, I'm going to plug a value in here that represents a URL. Now, uh, the first thing I'll do is simply paste in most of that URL. So the HTTP all the way through the page that we're hitting. I don't need to worry about the filter equals plant. Uh, that's not needed in our case. And as a matter of fact, I'm going to delete the question mark as well. That question mark simply delineates our name value pairs. Now, here's where things get a little bit tricky. I'm going to have an open paren right after the P, uh, plant details PL. And then we're going to say plant ID equals and then we're going to say dollar sign, open curly, close curly, 
and then close out the parentheses. And I'm going to go ahead and delete, delete that 1721 because that's just the Acer Capolipis. Instead of the 1721, what we're going to do is we're going to plug in a value that represents this specific row or this specific plant. Now, what value would that be? Well, remember, every time we shake hands with a plant object, we put it into this plant variable. And, if we, and that plant variable is essentially a plant DTO. And if we scroll up a little bit, we'll see that we do have a, a something called GUID, which is populated from our JSON stream. And we have a get GUID and set GUID method. So to plug in that GUID value, we just use a little bit of ognal syntax, object graph notation language syntax. And we simply say plant.GUID. What that's going to do is it's going to look at this variable and it's going to look for a getter or setter method for GUID. If it finds it, it's going to invoke the getter method in this case, and it's going to plug that unique identifier in and replace this dollar sign open curly close curly stack. Now the parentheses here indicate any kind of parameters that we want to add to that URL. We could add more than one parameter. In this case, I only need one. Be very careful here because there are a lot of symbols going on. The at symbol, the open curly here, the match and close curly here, the uh, open paren, the close paren, the dollar sign, the open curly, close curly. It's really easy to mistype one of these, especially when you get to the end and you have close curly, close paren, close curly. So just be mindful of that. Let's save and let's go ahead and try one more time. We will uh, take this back to our consolidated view, right click, and then say run ants or debug as Java application. Give it just a few moments to come up. Okay, and it's up. I love how quickly that comes up again. So go back to our page and we will search for, let's think of something else. Let's go with tulip. So there's tulip as a flower, but there's also tulip tree, one of my favorite trees as well. So I put in tulip and I search, fingers crossed, pet the rabbit's foot. And we see, sure enough, we have several different kind of, we have a tulip oak, the tulip tree, and the, I don't know what that is, some other kind of tulip. Note that this is ID 511. Now, I'm getting my hopes up here because if you can look at the bottom of my browser, you notice that it is showing a hyperlink that does appear to be correct because plant ID equals 511. If I go to the tulip oak, the plant ID is 5248. If I go to whatever this other one is, the tulipa, let's call it that, it's 4224. Now I have to say this has piqued my interest a little bit, uh, but I'm going to go ahead and click on the tulip tree 511. And let's confirm when I click, it navigates to plant places using that URL. And let's confirm that we see the tulip tree. Again, one of my absolute favorites has just a beautiful uh, flower that looks like a tulip, hence the name. Also a very big and very durable tree, but that's a whole other can of worms. This is one that I've seen all over the world, particularly in North America and also in Europe, uh, fairly common in England. So a beautiful tree. Let's go to the, I'm going to say that's Tulipa turkestansia. Let's click on this one. And um, this one, incidentally, is one that I GPSed in Oxford, England. So another one in Oxford, another one in England. But nonetheless, you see that each row corresponds to unique ID, and that unique ID corresponds to a uh, essentially a page that we can go to to visit and see more details about this plant. So that's a look at how to take a, res a, a result or a list of objects, show those objects in a list in Bootstrap, Make it pretty by prettying up the two-string method, and then also adding a hyperlink. I hope this video has been helpful, and I look forward to reading your comments.